This morning, God has called his servant, Brother Barrow, a friend of mine for a while. He has called him to deliver his message. And I need not give him all the accolades, but give God all the glory. He will present to us the true and all the unadulterated word of God this morning. Give him your undivided or undivided attention and pray for him as he comes. Amen. Welcome again to our morning's worship uh, this morning. I want to take us back to our scripture just briefly. Uh, read this morning again, just as a reminder, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Again, says, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Ephesians 6, verses 11 and verse 17 says, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand the walls of the devil and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the title for this morning is The Virus and the Cure. 
But before we talk about or get into it, let's first establish what exactly a virus is. Now in science, for example, or in biology, there are certain things that we look for to discern whether something is considered living or non-living. For example, all living things must obey the laws of the universe, must have order, uh, must have animation, and all living things experience death. But the thing about viruses, for example, is viruses, they violate actually one or more of those properties of life. For example, they don't, they don't really use energy per se. And there's a twist in regards to how they reproduce or how they replicate. So the question is, where then do viruses fall? And for humanity purposes, we normally see viruses or we associate them as agents of death. So where exactly then would a virus fall under? They're not living things. That's what they're considered as. And because they're known as agents of death, for example, the last pandemic prior to the one that we're in right now was back in 1980 to 1920. That was the Spanish flu pandemic. Over 20 million to 100 million people passed away during that time. But in our busy lives day by day, in society overall, we sometimes forget that there are other viruses. There's, there is a big virus that we should be concerned about. And that virus obviously is sin. Just like the Spanish flu resulted in the death of many, sin also results in death. Viruses as they survive, they replicate, and they carry their purposes, they ultimately will cause the host to die. As you read again in Romans 6.23, the Bible says the wage of sin is death, but is their cure. And we'll look at that this morning as we go into God's holy message. Shall we bow reverently as we pray? Gracious, gracious, gracious Father in heaven, unworthy I am to stand before a people, sinful I am as well. But I ask, Lord, at this moment, you purge this vessel. Let not me be seen. Let your words be heard. And may your people be blessed. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so viruses, in order to do their work, they must first find a way in. And the question is, well, how do they get their way in? To get in, they must enter through what is called a portal of entry. And any pathogen, bacteria or viral, they must come in through one of these means. Some of these portals of entries, for example, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our noses, our skin, reproductive organs, or even through vectors such as mosquitoes, for example, or even sandflies. But once the virus now has got in through one of these portals, that's not enough. Now the real work of the virus begins. Once inside, the virus will go through what we call five general phases to keep it surviving, to keep it going. The virus must first look for a host. Now we'll think, for example, we're at a host, but internally now from, organ, from a cellular level, the host for the virus is actually going to be the cell. And once the virus finds the host, finds the cell, then these five phases must occur. Phase number one is called absorption. And during the absorption, there are two steps that's carried out. There's attachment onto the cell, and then there's penetration in. But how exactly do viruses accomplish this? Well, on our cells, we have little proteins that are called receptors. These receptors are there for our benefit, growth factors, for example, to receive our hormones. But these very receptors that are used for good in us the viruses we use to carry out evil within as well. 
And these very same receptors are the gateways by which the viruses will get into the cell. Viruses are equipped with signals, glycoproteins, for example, that allow them to attach the cells and open the door and now finally get their way in. And believe it or not, the virus is mimicking what naturally resides in our bodies. Sin, in essence, also behaves the same way. It mimics as close as possible what should enter into our souls. Once on lockdown, the virus just seemingly goes in and makes itself right at home. No problem. Just again, as sin, once it gets in, enters our mind and our soul and just seemingly makes itself comfortable as well. Now again, sin, just like viruses, must enter through one of the portals of entry, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue for taste, our skin for touch. And each one of these portals of entry for sin also come with very unique receptors on them as well. For our eyes, we have what are called rods and cones. And those cells capture images that we see day by day. Our ears have nerve cells that capture vibrations of sound that we hear day by day. Our nose contain olfactory nerve cells that capture smells that we smell day by day. Our tongue have taste buds that have receptors that help us distinguish taste day by day as well. Our skin has a variety of different cells in there, nerve cells included, that perceive multiple or different stimuli. And sin, once it gets into the organism through any of these portals, behaves very similarly as a virus once it gets in to the organism as well. Remember we're counseled, guard well the avenues to the soul. But again, once viruses get in to the whole cell, once sin is into the whole cell as well, we see what can transpire afterwards. Even the fallen angel himself, as read from Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 14 and 16, the Bible reads that thou art the another cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways. For the day that thou was created until iniquity was found inside of thee. Now, after the virus has got in, what then happens next? We have a process called uncoding. And uncoding now, which is step two, the viruses goes in and simply undresses themselves, if that makes sense. It kind of breaks apart. The shield on the outside falls off. The capsid falls off. And what's now free to roam in the cell is really the genome of the nerve cell, sorry, of the viral, uh, viral of the virus that will now try to work from inside and then work its way to the outside. Now, sin does the same thing, comes in, makes itself comfortable, removes its coat, removes its shoes, and then starts to carry its objective from within to also come also to the out. Now, once sin is entered the mind again, final preparations is being made by the sin itself. But sometimes it is hard to recognize that the sin is actually in there still at this point. Now, once the virus is in and has uncoated itself, here's now what happens next. The virus uses self to replicate itself, absorbed, uncoded, familiar within its environment, now the virus will start to replicate its own genome to make more copies of itself. It uses the cell's host machinery, for example, its enzymes, which we'll talk about a little bit more, to make more copies of its own viral genome. 
And for sin itself, once sin enters into the mind officially, the sin starts to amplify itself as well. Sin will become stronger and stronger and stronger. The virus will use enzymes, normally meant to create proteins for ourselves or to help make us more DNA, to make new cells, but is using those entities in the cell to make more copies of viruses on their own. So the virus uses self to replicate its own self, and sin will also use self to become more and more stronger within as well. But once the virus has replicated its DNA, or its DNA or RNA, depending on what type of virus it is, then what happens next? We have all these multiple strands of genetic material now that doesn't belong to us or to that cell in that cell. So now what have to be done? We now have to assemble more of the same viruses and prepare them now for release. This is steps four and steps number five. Join replication step, here's what's made in the cell. We make more genetic material. We make more caspis, which covers the material of the virus to kind of protect it on its way out. And all these pieces now are used together to now build more and more viruses inside that cell that was infected with it. Once the assembly has been finished, the cell is now full with virals, with viruses. And if it becomes too full, what should happen naturally? It will burst. And when it bursts, all those viruses are now aware, free to roam and look for other hosts to infect its impact as well. So by essence, the host dies because of the virus, just like sin causes death ultimately as well. In the brain, the spiritual mind starts to transform into now what? A more worldly mind. And the mind that was once connected to Christ now becomes more connected to the world, which eventually leads then to eternal death. Again, the Bible reads in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here, obviously now, of viruses. This is a cell filled up, bursting at the seams, ready to go. And now the virus is out. But well, you would think that's where this ends. No, no, no. More viruses are, sorry, more cells are impacted. But now we're starting to talk now about generations of cells that become impacted as well. For our minds, sinful minds now start to seek what? Other minds. To become simple as well. And suddenly, there's an old saying, birds of a feather, they flock together. But some viruses are unique. They do have the ability to actually incorporate their DNA, their genome or RNA into the cell's genome. And that adds a whole new layer to what a virus, and in essence, what sin can do. There's a group of viruses called a retrovirus. And retroviruses, they're able to incorporate their genome into our cell's genome. And when that occurs now, if that cell with the viral genome inside of it replicates, then what's happening? Generations upon generations upon generations of cells, they all carry the genome of the what? Of the virus. Just like, for example, how as humans, our sins can be what? Passed down through generations as well. Let's go to Exodus. We can see this again in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, one of the commandments. It reads as follows. Thou shalt not make unto thee any raven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in thee earth beneath or that is in thee water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third 
and fourth generation of them that hate me. In essence, believe it or not, I consider this the first taste of genetics in scripture, where you see, for example, where sins can be passed down through the generations over time. So we've now completely gone through the steps of what a virus will do from within. Absorption, which includes attachment, penetration, uncoding, got in there, made itself right at home. Then replication, use self to make more copies of itself. Then once they've done that, reassembles all these new genomes together, makes a brand new virus, and releases itself through by bursting the cell or lysis, and now we go on to infect other cells as well. So while causing death, obviously, these viruses, they seek other cells to infect. And now all of a sudden, we now start to talk about what's called the magnitude of the infection, or what we call the magnitude of the sin itself. The overall body now externally starts to show the magnitude, the signs or symptoms of being infected by the virus. And infection now has become official. Now, when it comes to being sick, there are five major steps involved. Incubation period, that's kind of what we just covered, where the pathogen gets in, you don't know it's there, and it just grows out of control a little bit. Perdomo period, when you have some vague symptoms, then we go to illness. That's when now it becomes very apparent that you're ill. Then you start to recover. There's decline, things start to dampen a little bit. And convalescence now where there's no symptoms or signs left over. Now for incubation now, some viruses can live inside of you up to 10 years and you not know that you have it within. Others incubation period can be just one to two days. For example, the flu virus, one to two days. The common cold, one to three days. Dengue, five to eight days. But one that stands out down at the bottom, warts, for example, and rabies, 30 to 100 days, 30 to 450 days. And HIV, for example, can live inside you up to 10 years, and you have no clue it's lying within you at that time. So when these incubation periods have passed, the illness raises its ugly head. There's coughing, there's sneezing, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, rash, itching, burning, swelling. The inward has now become what? Outward, and it's become now manifest. Let's look at one virus that's fam that's that we're all familiar with, chickenpox, varicella. And this, this virus, as we know it, also causes shingles. Generally speaking, you'll see this virus in children anywhere between ages two to age six. And the initial stages, the incubation stage for our chicken pots is about two weeks. You pick it up, don't know you have it for about two weeks. And suddenly, the symptoms start to appear. There's a fever for about 24 hours. That's the predominal stage. And then what you know, illness kicks in. These red popicles, these, these red bumps, you wanna call that, appears on your chest and back. They become filled with fluid 24 hours after that. 36 hours later, they become obsolescent. And you see that the virus now, or the, the bumps, quote unquote, they spread upward and also where? Downward throughout the entire body. But eventually, each of those bumps become shriveled up as they burst and those viruses escape and go out to infect others. And we start to form what we call scabs. Now, once that you're in that stage, now you're going obviously into decline. But you know, some of those scabs, as they start to heal up, reminds a little bit of sin. Sin comes, it appears, and it starts to do what? Disappear. But what about those scabs? Do they always go away? Not quite. What can they leave sometimes? They leave scars. Viruses and sin can leave one scars. And believe it or not, they can also be reborn 
later down the road again. So the scabs, they fall off, but for some, they may heal, but you're what? But you're scarred. And you have a permanent reminder of what you were once infected with. But you think, for example, that when you get chicken pox when you're young, it's gone. It will never come back. But lo and behold, that is not always the case. The virus will sometimes settle by a nerve cell and wait there for years, sometimes decades, until the right time again where that virus becomes reactivated. It travels down your nerve cell. And before you know it, when you thought you were cured from chicken pots, it comes back full throttle in your adult years as now what's called shingles. Sin does the same thing. It will leave and seemingly do what? Go away, just disappear. But under the right conditions, sin is again reborn. It lays dormant for so many years, but then it just pops up and you wonder why well, I thought I was over this. This was seen a little bit, or, this, or how the virus works was seen in the experience that David had. Now let's go a little bit to 2 Samuel. Hope I can see this. 2 Samuel chapter, sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm going to go through a couple of verses um, here and there. Going to verse one first, we see number one, that Samuel first what? He tarried after he tarried at Jerusalem. And while he tarried in verse two, it came to pass that David arose from his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So here we go now. How did this sin, this virus, get into David? It came through his what? The eyes, the portal. The portal was open. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, It is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elihim, the wife of Uriah, the, sorry, I can't say that well, the Hittite. And David sent messengers and, messengers and took her. And she came in unto him and he lay with her, for she appeared fire from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David said, Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. So now we're seeing the impasse of the infection striking David little by little. As we continue, let's go to verse 14. There we go. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to the hands of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire, retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. So one event is now leading to other events. And now the infection has become fully established externally. Verse 17, and the men of the city went out and followed Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah, the Hittite, died also. But they did stop there. Verse number 26, 27. The wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead. She mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David set, sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bear his, him a son. But the thing that David had done had displeased the Lord. So after speaking of Naaman, sorry, Nathan, David was told about the scars of his infection. He survived, but a bigger scar would remain for him. Second Samuel 12, 13 and 14. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, but thou shalt not die. How be it, because my deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So the scar that David was to incur was the death of his child. Verse 15, And Nathan departed unto his house. 
And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. Verse 18, and it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. David would carry the scar, the reminder of that infection for the rest of his life. But he also accepted the will of God. But one may also ask the question, how can one survive? If by circumstance, the virus, sin gets in, gets through one of the pores of entry, one must take the consideration that you must always wear the armor of God. And the armor of God includes these things that we call white blood cells. It tells you a little bit. So in our bodies, for example, we have cells that are called white blood cells. They're called leukocytes and they're cellular components of our blood. And these white blood cells defend our bodies against infection and also disease. But here's how they do it. They ingest foreign materials. They ingest cellular debris. They destroy infectious agents, invaders that come in, viruses, for example. They destroy cancer cells. They produce and release antibodies. So, what is our white blood cells against sin? Very simple. The Bible reads in Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 11, it says to do what? Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12. For you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual witness, with wickedness in high places. Now verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of, which is the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, that is our white blood cell. But keep in mind though, the enemy will use that very sword against us to get us infected still. Did he try it? Yes, he did. He tried it with Christ in the wilderness. Let's go to, actually, before we get there. So HIV, for example, and you can see on the picture again, this is a white blood cell that's being attacked by viruses supposed to destroy a cell. And HIV does this in the sense that it's a retrovirus it uses white blood cells, the very thing that's supposed to be used to destroy it, as its own host cell. It attacks it, and gradually, as your white blood cell comes to come what? Lower and lower, your defenses now become depleted, where you have no shot against anything else that may come in uh, to your body, so you're unprotected. So when a person is left completely defenseless, that is when a secondary fashion come in. And Satan tried this with Christ as a reading Luke chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answered unto him, saying, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What did Satan do in this temptation? He used the very sword to try to attack Christ. That sword came from Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Satan quoted scripture as he tried to attack Christ our Savior. But how did Christ respond? He used his own scripture. Again, it reads in Luke chapter 4, verse 12. And Jesus answered him, said, answer, say, answer and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And what Christ used to counteract that sword, if that makes sense, was Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, where it says again, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as he tempted him in Massa. But what if I am fully infected? 
what if I fail to use the armor of God? Victory can still be yours. God still heals, and God is the ultimate cure. In John chapter 9, Jesus healed the blind man. In Judges 16, 28 to 30, Samson, who was infatuated, having lost sight of God, was able to find grace in his greatest moment of weakness, and it ultimately became his greatest moment of strength. For Naaman, the leper in 2 Kings, though he was scarred, he was made pure through the grace of God. Jonah, as mentioned last week, was not consumed by the big fish, but once he humbled himself, the Lord gave mercy on him and put him back onto dry land. The demonic man possessed in Mark chapter 5, consumed by a legion of demons, had Christ able to see through to his character and provided mercy upon him as well, where he became purified and put in his right mind as well. Lazarus experienced the full penalty of sin. He experienced death. And God showed that even death, due to the virus called sin, that too will die. God is the cure for the pandemic caused by the virus known as sin. And soon and very soon, the end of sin will come. The end of the pandemic of sin will come. The Bible reads in Revelation 21, verse 24, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. There shall be no more sorrow. There should be no more crying. There should be no more pain. For all former things have passed away. Jesus will return. Let us survive the attacks of the virus known as sin by wearing the armor of God and be ready for his return soon. May God be pleased.